Welcome to Victory Christian Center. You're about to hear from our senior pastor, Pastor Stefan Schlugel, as he brings a message to the church on a Sunday service. We are currently going through a series of messages entitled God Empowered Families. Um, and uh, in the beginning, we talked about God uh, in the family. And uh, that was a carryover. We had the previous message was entitled God in Politics. And then we said, well, God in the family. So we moved from politics to the family. Uh, and uh, I believe that God wants to freshly empower each family that is represented here and each family of people that are listening, that are watching this program. Um, uh, just some uh, repeats of what we've said so far, a little bit of a recap uh, before we move on from there. But uh, we said that the family unit is the basic building block of any society or nation. All right. Uh, we said that if the family unit is strong, then the nation will be strong. If the family unit is weak and broken down, the nation will be weak and broken down. In fact, we so much believe that, that each time one of us gets stronger in our family life, as a result of that, the nation gets stronger. Now, for one single person, um, depending on who they are and what they do, it might not make a huge difference. But if we can affect family after family after family in our nation, we've got a stronger nation on our hands. And so really, uh, we need to start at the root uh, of na national problems and address family problems. Um, and uh, so, yeah. So we said that the seeds of family breakdown are many times sown in people's lives during their childhood. And that happens through uh, dysfunctional family dynamics that they're growing up in, they're observing that, uh, and then they're repeating that in their family when they get grow, you know, grow up and, and so forth. And then uh, it is also happening um, seeds of family breakdown and, and, and problems are sown in people's lives through a lack of child training. And we've covered some of the child training and some of the basic principles, I guess, because uh, we are dealing with the specifics in some of our small group courses that we're running right now. And we also said that sometimes there's not only a lack of proper child training, but there is wrong child training. You know, we can tra tra train our children wrongly by not realizing it, by just sheer neglect or having a wrong parenting philosophy or picking up one of the world's philosophies for parenting, which may sound good on the surface, but if you analyze it and put it next to the Word of God, you suddenly realize it is another one of those faulty philosophies that has been dressed up nicely, but if you analyze it, it is actually no good. So that was kind of uh, where we've been so far, uh, some of the things that we've repeated in each message, message thus far. Today is the fifth session in this series. This may be the last one today. See how we go this week, um, because we're looking forward to Peter getting up, pre preaching a couple of messages. I was meant to be in Auckland next week uh, uh, to do a political presentation, but as it stands with that uh, uh, silly virus that's messed that plan up a little bit. But anyway, we just take things in our strides. Let's pray and let's trust God that he will speak to us this morning. Father, once again, Lord, we are in your presence. We appreciate you. We love you. We honor you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've redeemed our lives from destruction. You've called us out of darkness into your wonderful, into your marvelous light. We set this time aside for the teaching and the preaching of the word. Lord, we pledge to be teachable people, that we're ready to learn new things, fresh things, to be reminded of things that we already know, and God, to learn new and fresh things. We thank you, Father, that your word is living and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts away things in our lives that are not supposed to be there, and it departs things into our lives that are supposed to be there, and we commit that to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we go. This morning, um, I would like to unfold some further things concerning uh, the the core of uh, the biblical family, which is the husband and the wife, uh, and uh, to a little extent talk about the children as well. Um, of course, when we talk about the core, you know, parents are not fit around the children, but children are fit around the parents. Um, 
And, you know, child parent, uh, child-centered parenting makes the, the children the focus of everything. Of course, every family will change when children come along. You've got to run into to a certain pattern. You know, that will absolutely affect everything. But in the end, we fit the children around our lives rather than make the children fit them around their lives and, you know, become child-centered parenting. So this morning, I would like to start out by speaking to you about the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. And when we're finished with that, that's right. We'll talk about the virtuous man, uh, because as I look around, I'm seeing virtuous men and virtuous women everywhere, all right, everywhere. So with that, uh, um, let me also talk to you about the subtitle of this morning's message. As I said, we've already said, the main title is God Empower Families, but the subtitle is Becoming Who God Made Us To Be. Becoming who God made us to be. Uh, and there's a bit of a sort of a, a play on words in here. And some, some of you might have to read it again and, and just to get the gist of what we are discussing here this morning. I want to first of all talk to you about who God made us to be. And then I'm talking to you about how we can become what God made us to be. Here we go. Uh, Proverbs chapter 31 verse 10. Uh, we've got 22 verses I want to read to you. Um, and this is mostly about the virtuous woman, but actually the virtuous man is mentioned in there as well. All right. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She's more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her, and she greatly enriches his life. And all the husband said, praise God. And so verse 12, she brings him good and no harm all the days of his life. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She's like a merchant ship. Uh, bringing her food from afar. Fancy calling your wife a merchant ship, right? <laughs> Verse 15, she gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household and plans the day's work for her servant girls. She goes to inspect a field and buys it. And from the earnings, she plants a vineyard. I mean, she's quite a girl, isn't she? Gosh, uh, she's energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night, her hands are busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting fiber. Most of you don't know what that means, but uh, I still remember I've seen spinning that was done by hand. Uh, she extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household, for every warm has warm clothes. She makes her own bedspreads. She dresses in fine linen and purple gowns. Verse 23 says to her, her husband is well known in the city gates for where he sits uh, with the other civic leaders. She makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell to the merchants. She's clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and uh, she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything uh, in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stained and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. Wow, what a list. Oh, she's amazing. She's a fantastic woman, this one. Um, let me just see where we're going to go with this. Uh, I always know where we start out, but I never know where we end up. I might need a little bit of help there, Paige. And, you know, really, you need to pray for me that I have the courage to say what needs to be said. And, uh, and that's not just when we talk about the women, but also with the men. Um, but you know what? Um, um, in fact, let me just give you an overall picture here. Um, the book of Proverbs is filled with God's practical wisdom for our lives. Proverbs is amazing. All of God's Word is amazing, but Proverbs is really amazing. We've said during our child training session, teach your children Proverbs because it's practical, it's applicable, it's one-liners. Uh, it addresses virtually every facet of daily living. 
And when I say virtually, I say, I'm sure it does, but, you know, I just want to hedge my, my bets a little bit and I say virtually because, I mean, you read through it, you think, gosh, it leaves no, no stone unturned. Uh, it is amazing, but it strongly focuses on excellence of character and on wise decision-making. You read through the book, book of Proverbs, it speaks about the wise person and the foolish person, and it tells them what they look like, and it tells them how the foolish person makes stupid decisions and the wise person makes wise decisions uh, all the way through. So it focuses strongly on excellence of character. And by the way, when we look at that word, the virtuous woman, actually the virtuous wife, she's a woman, but she's a wife. The virtuous wife, that word virtuous uh, can also be translated into the English word excellence. That's why the word virtuous is not just claimed for the female gender. A man is also virtuous if he's got an excellent spirit about him. So as I say, it fits for both. Uh, many of us that have been around for, for some years in the body of Christ and have heard teaching over the years, and you know, there used to be a magazine uh, out um, for women called Above Rubies. Probably better to read that uh, than, the, you know, uh, uh, Women's Weekly or some other stupid magazine um, and, and so forth. But anyway, as I say, we could speak about the virtuous man just the same as the virtuous woman because those terms are applicable to both the male as well as the female gender. It speaks about, Proverbs does, it speaks about the roles and functions of husbands, wives, and children within the family unit. As I say, it is very practical. Now, Proverbs 31, those 22 verses that we have just read is actually an acronym, and it's a, it's a poem that is made up from the 22 Hebrew letters, um, and each one of them highlighting one of the noble characteristics of one of the noble character traits of this virtuous woman. All right, now in the Hebrew language, they have 22 letters, and each one of those 22 verses begins with one of those letters in an acronym all the way down, and then it gives uh, the quality about that particular woman. Now, as an aside, um, and we're not preaching out of Psalm 119, but all of Psalm 119, which is the longest psalm in all of the Bible, is also an acronym uh, of the Hebrew letters, 22 paragraphs all the way through. Here we are given 22 sentences, but in Psalm 91, it gives 22 paragraphs, about uh, six, seven, eight, uh, ten verses, and then it moves on to the next letter, and that's what this is. It is a poem, uh, and the fact that we, in English, we, we, we've lost that in the translation, we lost the lettering, but as I say, if we could read this thing in Hebrew, we would realize that somebody has taken some time here uh, to kind of break this whole thing down and to put it into the Hebrew letters verse by word. Now, interesting, if we were to back up a little and go into verse 1 of chapter 31, um, there is the mother of this King Lemuel. And, and Lemuel would appear to be a nickname for King Solomon. And Solomon's mother taught him that, and then he then made the poem popular and it was written down so that you and I can get in today of, of what, really what, what is Solomon's wisdom, but actually this wisdom he received from his mother. And, you know, we receive wisdom from our parents, hopefully. We receive, uh, you know, the ability to make good decisions and so forth. But as I say, this woman here uh, is really quite an amazing woman. And as it says in verse 29, and we're still just laying a foundation so we can bounce off of that. But when it says in verse 29, there are many verses virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. All right? She's way out there. Okay? Can I submit to you and suggest to you that this is what the ideal wife, mother looks like? The Word of God paints a picture. It's rather a tall order, I might say. So when you read this, don't be discouraged, but be encouraged what is possible uh, when we take the time to train ourselves and to be trained and to exercise our character and those abilities that the Bible speaks about here. So many capable women, but you surpass them all. So in that phrase here, it's almost like God is holding up the picture of what a godly wife and a godly mother looks like. Um, and uh, I, would, uh, I would encourage every uh, woman to strive to become a virtuous woman. And when the woman then marries somebody and becomes a wife, she's a virtuous wife. 
How have you know that there's not a miracle that happens when a woman gets married in terms of her character? If she's not a virtuous woman before marriage, she's not going to be a virtuous woman afterwards. That's why every parent should seek to train their children to become virtuous, you know, virtuous boys and girls that are growing into virtuous men and virtuous women. Can anybody agree with that? All right. Uh, and, and if the word amen is too old-fashioned for you, just say yes. All right, that'll encourage me. Just say yes. Here we go. So, she's quite a girl. Um, where do you start? I hadn't planned to break it all down verse by verse. The sometimes we go systematic, but gosh, there's so much in there. It takes us three weeks just to break down what the virtuous woman looks like. But let me tell you, she's quite a girl. Um, she is... Let me begin with that. Uh, it's only mentioned in the latter part, but it speaks about a woman that fears the Lord. She is a woman of faith. And faith in a woman, and we're talking Christian women. Now, there's many good women in the world that are not born again, but we're talking about the, the Christian ideal. This is God's ideal of what a woman looks like. She's a woman of faith. And I'm mindful now when Paul the Apostle spoke to young Timothy and he says, the faith that is in you, he says, young Timothy, is a faith that I first saw in your mother. So the mother passed on the faith to young Timothy and Paul made mention of that. So there's something that, you know, there's many good skills that a woman can pass on, but the primary good quality that a woman passes on to her children is her faith. Oh, I just, uh, you know, I mean, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? So I think this is probably a good place to start. She is a woman of faith. And then furthermore, she's a diligent woman. Boy, she goes all day. Uh, she gets up early in the morning, and the Bible says that her lamp uh, burns late into the night. She's, just, she's not a lazy girl. She doesn't sit around. She, she's busy. She's engaged. She's uh, engaged with the family. She's contributing towards the family income. I mean, he's quite a guy. He's sitting at the gates with the elders. So this guy's been around for a little while. He's not a young upstart. Neither is she. You know, they've been around for a while. So if you as a young person, look at this and you are discouraged. Don't be. Just set it up as an ideal and say, this is what I'm striving to become. Actually, in a little while, I'm going to tell you if you're born again, in your spirit, you're already that. But it's waiting to come out. All right? And we'll discuss later on what that looks like. All right? So... He's sitting at the city gates, uh, which is kind of reference to where city elders used to meet. It's like, you know, a civic chamber in the council chamber, so to speak, where he was there making important decisions along with the other city leaders. So he's quite a guy. She's quite a girl. Now, let me say that didn't start out that, that way. If you're a young couple today and like, oh, gosh, you know, we're just, you know, struggling to make ends meet and so forth. Be encouraged. You walk in the word. God's going to bless you. As I say, I mean, if, if some, 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 sometimes we don't tell, Vanessa and I don't tell our stories often enough in the early days when, when you know, we, we paid our bill and sometimes people say, oh, I can't afford this, I can't afford that. We pay for our necessities and there was nothing left over uh, after that. And, you know, we just honored God, we tithed, we never missed a tithe and we just decided that we was going to put God first. And when things begin to unfold, you know, it goes like, we go from glory to glory, we go from strength to strength, we go from one degree of faith to the next degree of faith, and then, and then we, 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 yeah, there you go. We just become who God always intended for us to be, but it doesn't happen overnight. So be patient with yourself. So she's, a, she's an amazing girl. She, she's up. She's up early. Um, she stays up late just to make things happen. She uses her gifts, her talents, her abilities. Uh, she goes out, and she's a businesswoman, that one. Uh, she, she goes out, and she buys a field. And then she makes a profit off of that field, because when you buy a field, you plant something on it, you sell it, uh, and then there's some money there. And she takes those profits, and she, she buys a vineyard. Now, now the field is for, for, for eating off of, uh, but the vineyard is is to sort of add a little bit of a, uh, um, what shall we say, uh, add a little bit of comfort into life, whatever that may mean to different people. All right, so, so I mean, she, she's an employer. She employs servant girls, and she gets up and she organizes them. She, she's got her, the food ready. She's got every, everything ready. <laughs> the Bible says there that she's like a merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. Uh, she doesn't just 
throw something together, she lays it on. She, she really makes an effort. And the Bible says that she, 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 she does, her husband trusts in her. He, he, he can trust her. Um, I nearly said it with the credit card, but we're not going to go there. He can <laughs> trust her. Um, and she does him good all the days of his life. She does him good every day. She does him good every day. I wonder what that would mean, but, you know, that's up for discussion on another day. We're actually looking at getting married couples together and speak about that in, in more detail. Uh, but we need to be careful in the broader context here. But she does him good every day. You know what's happening here, and I'll just throw this in, and then we're going to move on quickly and pretend that it wasn't said. But, uh, but um, she's an amazing girl. Boy, she's busy all day. But, you know, the Bible says in here, and in fact, in the new... Uh, uh, new um, Translation that we read out of, if you go back into one of the more literal translations, it says that she girds, she girds her loins with strength. Loins speaks about the reproductive parts of male and female. You know, after she's, got, she's been busy all day, she's still got plenty of strength for her husband. And you know, there's a tragedy unfolding in society where both men and women are barely giving each other the leftovers rather than prioritizing on each other and letting everything else be secondary. There's a real key here. So say, I've been burdened with this thought and with this concept, and I'm just praying for more courage. That's all I'm praying for. When I got the courage, I'm going to bring out those concepts and those words in the right context and in the right setting. But I'm telling you, there's something unspoken about here that needs to be spoken about, and the devil has lied to people. The devil really fights it. I mean, gosh, you know, just to quickly summarize, and then we will move on. And as I said, we pretend it wasn't said. But, you know, before people get... Get married, the devil tries everything to get them into bed with each other. And after they get married, the devil tries everything to keep him out of bed with each other. There's just a thought in there that you think about that. Uh, but anyway, as I said, we haven't said this. We've just now, we've just now moved on. She's an amazing woman. She's an amazing girl. All right. She, she, um, yeah, she's a businesswoman. She's an employer. She does her husband good. Her children call her blessed. She's energetic. She's strong. Um, she doesn't nag. She doesn't complain. As I say, she is the perfect woman. Um, the Bible says that um, in, uh, in Proverbs chapter 12, that the virtuous woman is a crown to her husband's head. But a woman that brings shame is like rottenness to his bones. So as I say, you know, Proverbs is pretty punchy, isn't it? It just doesn't mince words. And then it speaks about the nagging woman that is like a dripping tap. I mean, it's all scripture. All right. So, but she's not that. Uh, she, she does not nag. She does not, you know, uh, like, you know, it says in there in Proverbs. Uh, and then again, we move on and pretend that this wasn't said. But it says that it is better to have just a simple dinner with just vegetable uh, and, and peace in the house than to have a, a nagging woman and having a very fancy and nice dinner because the nagging messes everything up. It says it is better to live in the, in the rooftop than to live with a nagging woman in the house. All right, but now we will definitely move on because some of you are like, oh, no, pastor, you've just gone where, where you shouldn't have gone. Uh, well, that's what we do as preachers. We, we trade where other people fear to trade. So here we go. Uh, she is an amazing woman. So women, be encouraged. Uh, uh, mothers, teach your children, but in particular your girls, uh, what that looks like uh, and, and model it in your lifestyle and teach it in principle and in practice. We can affect the whole nation by simply doing what the Word of God tells us to do. So again, every woman should seek to become a virtuous woman. Um, and you know, the, the, the New Testament says that the older women should teach the younger women on how to love their husbands. Um, um, and, uh, and of course, you know, they say, well, well, of course I love my husband. No, well, but the older women know how the husband likes to be loved. All right, there's a certain way. And actually the, life, the wife loves to be loved in a certain way as well. Uh, and as I say, we need to learn all of that for, for us to be 
good, strong Christian families, good, strong Christian marriages. We need to know what that looks like. And look, anybody can take these principles, no matter where you are in life, whether you're married or unmarried. In some instances, people are even rebuilding their lives, uh, where, say, one marriage has all sort of unfolded and all come unstuck and everything. Then anybody can take these principles and to build and to rebuild. God sets that up as the ideal woman, the ideal wife, the ideal mother. And with that, I'm swinging on into point number two. And uh, I should have timed it because we want to give equal time to the man as we've done with the woman. Otherwise, the woman might say, oh, pastor, pastor, you weren't as detailed with the man as what you were with the women. Uh, no, the virtuous woman doesn't speak like that. So here we go. Um, <laughs> the virtuous man in Scripture. You know, there is a, or should I say, there is not a comprehensive block of Scripture like Proverbs 31 that speaks about the virtuous husband, but there are numerous scripture passages scattered throughout the scripture that paints a picture of what a godly husband really looks like and a godly father. And once again, I'm going to bring out a few of those scriptures there. It's certainly not the comprehensive list, uh, uh, nor, nor have we delved into everything that is said about the, the, the wife or the mother, but we've, you know, uh, we, we do what we've got time for. Um, but there is plenty of scriptures here. I want to start out with Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 5 and verse 9. And uh, this is out, an, out of the New American Bible. It says, A man is virtuous if he does what is right and just. If he lives by my statutes and is careful to observe my ordinances, that man is virtuous. I got that scripture here, for, hopefully for no other reason than to point out that the word virtuous, the character quality of virtue, virtuous is not just allocated to women only, it is also allocated to men. In fact, a little bit earlier and later on in the same chapter here, it uses the, the term the virtuous man. So there is a virtuous woman and there is a virtuous man. All right. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 We've already been there before and sort of picked up some snippets of truth there. I want to go back to it again to paint a clearer picture. It says, husbands, love your wives. Um, And it says, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word, and to present her to himself a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be united with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Um, and uh, and uh, just as an, as an aside here, as soon as they get married, God has joined them together to, to, to be one flesh, but from there on they learn to become one flesh. How many of you know what we're talking about here? It's one thing that God has done in our spirit, but then that needs to be fleshed out in our day-to-day living. You know, Paul said to Timothy or to Titus, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What we're discussing here today, uh, the various qualities that we are highlighting here, if you're born again, you're born again man or a born again woman, those qualities sit, they reside in your spirit already in seed form. All right. And we are learning how to bring that out and bring that out into our daily living. And we do that through the Word of God, we do that through the help of the Holy Spirit. Um, So they become one flesh. Verse 32, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Okay, so... um, as one reasonably comprehensive scripture, but it doesn't cover all facets of what a godly husband looks like. Um, and uh, in Colossians, just two more verses, and then we'll make some comments uh, uh, along those lines as well. Colossians chapter 3, verse 19, again it says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh uh, against them. Okay, and then First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says, In the same way, your husbands must give honor to your wives. 
That's why when we have a young couple that get married, we build the word honor into the vows that I will love and honor you. Um, because to love without honor is not really love. As I said, there is a sort of a crossover of meanings in these words. But he says that he gives honor to the wife. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. Um, now, this is not just a, a man and a woman living together. This is a husband and wife living together. How do you know that there's a difference? And the difference is they made a vows that made a commitment to each other. You know, living together is very common today, but it's not marriage. Marriage is, is when, when you have two people making a commitment in the presence of witnesses in a kind of a ceremony with their families around them to witness that these guys are now committing to each other, uh, and we will help them to the best of our ability to help them to live out that commitment. All right? Um, so, my, in the same way... Uh, Husbands must give honor to the wives. Treat your wife with understanding. As you live together, she may be weaker than you are, uh, but she's your equal partner in God's gift of this new life. Treat her uh, as you should so that your prayers will not be hindered. Okay. Um, so again, there's a reasonably uh, comprehensive uh, list that begins to form. If we have more time, we would swing into the qualifications uh, that are listed there for leaders in the, in the church, uh, for, for bishops, um, even for deacons, that they are married people. They're not just live together people. They're married people, and they've got certain qualities that, uh, that they have fleshed out in their own family life because the Bible says if a man does not know how to take care of his own family, how can he take care of the, of, the, you know, of the church. And so there are some qualities listed in there that if we pack all of that together, we will come up with a very, very comprehensive list. But so far to say that uh, if you as a man uh, look at this um, and uh, if you're a little bit uh, awe-inspired or if you're a little bit awed by this whole thing, it would be no surprise because it is a tall order. To be a godly man is a tall order, let me tell you. Because what happens here is that, uh, that uh, when we look at, you know, when particularly the New Testament looks at the husband and as the, at the wife, it compares the husband to Jesus Christ. Well, that's the tall order right there. All right. And it compares the wife to the church. Um, and that's why Paul says, but this is a mystery. But I speak about Christ and the church. The picture that Paul paints for us through the scriptures here by the you know, leading of the Holy Spirit is uh, that a husband and wife relationship should look like a Jesus and church relationship. Um, and the, and the, the, the facets of truth in there are just enormous. We've just read through the fact that, uh, that a man, if he doesn't treat his wife right, can have his prayers hindered. He prays, but he gets no answers because the prayers are hindered by him not treating his wife like an equal partner. That's what it says here, that they are co-heirs together of this grace of life. One translation says that they are equal partners. Yes, the man is the head of the wife, but he brings her up alongside him as his equal partner, and he treats her like his queen, and she helps to uh, rule and reign. You see, we as the body of Christ, we are ruling and reigning with Christ. And you need just a, just a thought that comes to mind, and you can figure out if it fits or not. But you know what? With Donald Trump as the uh, president of America right now, and hopefully for the next term, he's got a good woman behind him. And I would like to suggest to you that many of the policies that he's rolling out uh, would have been encouraged by her because she's a good godly woman. Uh, so she helps him rule and reign in America. You think about that. Okay, she doesn't do it directly, but she does it indirectly. And, and women, you can go, come alongside your man. You can help him rule and reign. Listen to what he is saying and listen to where he wants to go. And de de depending on that, you're able to discern that this is the will of God. Otherwise, you need to bring wisdom to the man. I mean, there's some stupid man made some stupid decisions if they had, had all listened to the wife. Honestly. Um, and as I say, I've dealt with some selfish men over the years. Uh, just plain, 
selfish. Taking a couple of snippets out of the scriptures there, woman, submit to your wife. You know, they run with that and then they hold that up and everything else. Well, it's bigger than that, my friend. Uh, you need to Woman, submit to your husband. Thank you. See, this is what we're talking about. You see, <laughs> God's made a helpmate for me to help me. I mean, I can't make no mistakes because I've got my helper with me all the time. Praise God for that. So, so um, I just got distracted there. What did I say before? <laughs> but this is the thing for the husband uh, to become like Christ and for, for the husband to treat his wife like Christ treats the church. Again, the first thing that I should say about the man, that he's also a man of faith. Um, the biggest thing and the best thing that a man can pass on to his family is his faith. Praise God for all the other good qualities, but ultimately a faith that is passed on to the next generation. See, the Bible tells us that God chose Abraham to become the father of the Jewish nation. And he says, I know Abraham, he says, because he will command his children after him. Now, there's a very strong st statement there that he does not suggest his children after him. No, he commands his children after him. Abraham was a man of faith. We still speak of his faith today. Man, when you and I are gone, uh, the time comes for us to move on. Um, though I would think that most of us will be alive when Jesus returns. But anyway, that's up for you to, to determine that. Uh, but when we are gone, uh, they should still be speaking about our faith. They should be speaking about how we walked in the Word of God, how we walked in the integrity of the Word, being men of integrity and leading our families in a selfless sort of a way. Because Christ, He bought His, his church by giving His life. And that's the picture there. Christ wouldn't have a church if He had not given His life. And a man shouldn't have a wife unless he gives his life for his wife and enters into that covenant relationship uh, with him. And it's amazing. You know, Jesus, at the Last Supper, he sat down with his disciples, and he shared the covenant meal with them, the Passover meal, which became the, the, the meal, you know, of, of, the, of, the, of the, you know, the, the, the bread and the blood of the new covenant. He says that I'm making with you. He's basically initiating the church right there, entering into covenant. So as soon as he finished from there, they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's when he literally, literally and physically laid down his life. And friend, you know, sometimes as men, we get so excited when we get married, and praise God how good that is, you know. And the potential is absolutely wonderful, but the moment we're married, it's laying down our life on a daily basis to make sure that our families are taken care of, that our wife is taken care of, and that we can live as the godly family that God has called us to be. So he's a man of faith. He's a, he is a, a man that seeks to become like Christ because Christ is the ideal. Uh, that's what Paul has set up. He says, he says uh, the husband so loves the wife as Christ loves the church. And he says, I speak of a mystery, but it is actually no longer a mystery. You see, a mystery is a hidden truth. But when Paul explained the mystery, it was hidden no more. All right? I mean, Paul talked about the mystery all the way through. There were several mysteries. Christ in us, the hope of glory, that was a mystery. The whole church age, that was a mystery. Paul spoke about it. Uh, and then the husband and wife relationship, he says, it is a mystery. And it was something that they didn't have in the Old Testament to the same extent because Christ and the church did not exist uh, in the Old Testament so that Paul, uh, you know, one of the previous writers of the Old Testament, they could have not held up that picture. It wasn't there, but it is here now. All right, we look at the New Testament, we say, wow, you know, we're so grateful, we're so thankful for what uh, uh, Christ has done for us as the church. And, you know, we thank him. And, you know, sometimes when I speak to men, uh, and sometimes uh, men can get a little discouraged in the process because they go out, they go out into the battlefield of the marketplace day by day. He comes home, and then sometimes the family don't, haven't, been, haven't been learned or haven't been taught on how to say thank you for everything you're doing. <laughs> okay, so introducing thankfulness into a family. Thank you. When the meal's put down, thank you. Just simple things can make all the difference. Um, and so here you got the godly husband uh, again. Um, 
He's really quite a guy. He treats his wife with understanding as they live together. He learns. Uh, he even reads books to find out about the woman, about the female gender. You know, it's a bit of a tall order because we are main, us men are supposed to understand women, but I, I reckon that sometimes some women don't even understand themselves. So, you know, we talk about the co complexities of the female gender. Um, and um, <laughs> praise God. Shall I uh, um, <laughs> Don't go there. Don't mention the war, right? <laughs> don't mention the war. <laughs> uh, I've seen some of these pictures uh, of an electric uh, switchboard, and some of you have seen it. Some of these are fun things, and don't be offended by it. We can have a bit of fun together and not be offended by it. You've got the two switchboard, the two pictures side by side. Here's one switchboard, you know, an electrical switchboard that's where the power comes into the building, and then it gets distributed out to all the power points and all the lights, and, you know, like you've you got, you got one switch there. Um, one switch, it turns this thing on and off, uh, and they call this, you know, this is, is the main, like that's just one switch and the main's turned on, you know. And then you got another picture here of the switchboard and the complexities of it even baffles the best of the electrician. Even electrical engineers would struggle to get their head around it because there's switches everywhere and there's boards and then there's subboards and then there's something else over here and this connects to over there. And, and you know, us men, we're trying, ladies, we really are trying. So if you don't always get it right, please be patient with us. We are really trying. Okay. Um, so we talk about, uh, um, and, and that's why, you know, you sometimes a, uh, a man will speak more directly than sometimes what the female gender would, because sometimes female, women don't want to offend. Uh, well, us men, we don't want to offend either, but we just, you know, we speak and then we communicate and say, well, that was a bit strong. I said, well, I felt strongly about it and, and so forth. And then, so sometimes, you know, communication, if it's veiled communication, he will miss it. Let me tell you, ladies, if you just go around in euphemisms and, you know, and in veiled communication, he will probably miss it because he's a straight shooter. And that's not to say that you should shoot at him, but just try to explain to him in simple terminology what you mean so that he can get it, you know. He can get it. Um, and then life will be much better. Um, you know, they say happy wife, happy life. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a truth to that, uh, but you know what, uh, th th there are sometimes uh, in, the, in the female gender, um, a woman needs to learn to be happy without a man before she gets married. When she's married, she does not rely on him for her happiness. Because you will become happy out of the deposit of your own heart rather than what people you know, bring into your life. Now, they, they can enhance that, but if you're not happy before, you will not be happy afterwards. And if you're not happy before and you're not happy afterwards, he can do what he will. He can just never win. And sometimes men have given up because they just, I can't figure it out. I just can't get my head around it. And, 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 and it's almost like the devil has scrambled this thing up. It's not meant to be like that. All right, is everybody all right this morning? So there we go. Uh, the man is a godly man. He does what the word says. He does not rule by whim, but he rules by the truth of God's word. You know, one thing that they've talked about over the years when we talk about democracy and how the kings around the world and even dictators to this very day, they see themselves above the law. And that's the tragedy that, uh, you know, the whole issue around the Magna Carta that was put together in, uh, in England uh, with the, between the barons and the, and, the, and the king was that they really forced the king to say that even the king must be subject to the law. If the king is not subject to the law, then he's really no king at all. And the man must be subject to the word of God so that he can rule properly. If he's not subject to the word, he's really no good ruler at all. He's only a dictator. All right? So God's brought us together. Uh, he made us one, and then we become one, and we flesh it out uh, in our daily lives going forward. And in the end, uh, you know, male and female may disagree, but as I say, my wife sometimes uses the example of then her and I, we can be as stiff as chalk and cheese, but in the end, we come around the word and we agree on what the word says. All right? The word is our umpire. The word in the end tells us uh, uh, how 
things are going to be, and the Word tells us how we're going to live our lives. The Word tells us what decisions we're going to make, how we're going to spend our finances, that we're going to honor God with our tithe, no matter what happens. This is the Word. The Word becomes our constitution. The Word is the constitution of our marriage, if I can encourage you in this area. All right? So, man, it's a tall order. But each time you visit those scriptures that we've just looked at and meditate in those scriptures, we are becoming more and more like Christ so that we can be better husbands. Um, and uh, so let me talk to you, point number three, about becoming who God made us to be. You know, just to finish off the talk around men, males, uh, the blokes, the husbands, uh, every father um, should... And every parent should seek to train their children to become a, bo- a, a godly boy, a godly girl, so that they can be godly adults. Uh, but, you know, here's one thing, and this is another facet of th- truth I want to throw out there, is that sometimes, uh, you know, the women have got the major part in bringing up children um, in the early days of the lives of the children, because typically in the mother, you know, at least in the early part after the child is born, is with the child virtually 24-7 while he goes out into the battlefield of the marketplace to bring home the bacon, so to speak, and everything else. But you know, at a certain stage, the boy has to be handed over to the father who will help him to become a man. You know, not every, not every male is a man. Every male is a male. But for the male, for the boy to become a man, you've got to give him to the father. Because the father knows what that looks like. And sometimes it means that the father firms up on the boy. Because sometimes women can, and I'm speaking broadly, there's always the exception to the rule. But sometimes uh, mothers can spoil the boy. And then he'll get used to be spoiled and with no responsibility towards life. And then he gets married and he expects to be spoiled with no responsibility towards it. Uh, he only wants the benefits. It's like a man that wants to have a woman in his bed, but he doesn't want to marry her. He's a selfish man because he only wants the benefit of a woman, but he doesn't want the responsibility of the woman. It's getting real quiet now. <laughs> okay. And, and for that matter, but when, but when, uh, when the man's married, he, he, he doesn't have to earn sex. Uh, that's something that's built in. The virtuous woman, don't make him earn sex. He gets it without earning it because it's built in. That's why if I can encourage couples, we will get into that more in the right setting. Uh, But that whole area of of the unspoken area is more important. And you get that right and a whole lot of other things in your life will fall into place. I can assure you that. Okay, because we see it in the Word. (laughs) All right. Now, where did I get off on a sidetrack there? I was talking about the man. Uh, that's right. And handing the, the boys over. You, if you look at tribal cultures, uh, many of them operate in this fashion. Uh, I'm not saying that that's all the right way to operate, but I'm saying that, you know, the women, you know, look after the boy, bring him up to a certain stage. But then to initiate the boy from becoming a boy into manhood, and the Jewish people do that very well. Uh, they call it... Uh, Bar Mitzvah, uh, again, don't quote me on it. I just haven't fully studied that up. But uh, at age uh, 12, 13, they say, all right, boy, it's time to become a man. And they have a rite that they go through. It's the passage of rite where they pass, you know, make the boy go through it. And there's certain things that the, the boy's got to do before he become, he become a man. And, uh, and, and a big thing is responsibility. All right, we've got a whole lot of males running around sowing their wild oats in all directions, but they're not responsible. So you and I, as the people, are picking up the tab. <laughs> it's just we have a tragedy on, on our hands. Uh, you know, the, what's paid out in social welfare through our government is just a travesty. And where's the problem? The problem is in the family. Fatherless homes. I was going to speak about that, but I knew we wasn't going to have time. Uh, so... <laughs> So the boy becomes a man, and the father helps him to become a man. And when the father firms up on the boy, don't let the mother come in and rescue the boy and keep him a boy. The boy needs to become a man. 
And there will be some strong times and some strong things to get the boy to switch into manhood rather than to just stay a boy. <laughs> so we got a whole lot of big boys. We got 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 year old boys running around that have never become men. <clears throat> so becoming who God made us to be. When we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior and become born again, God makes us a new creation and places his love in our spirits. And just to bear that out, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says here that this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. If you're a man in this house, you're a male, and you're born again, raise up your hand and show me your hands. All right, I could do the same for the women. I just want to see the hands, man. You, you are a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. And you see what happens is that if parents haven't helped a, man, a, a boy to become a man, then the role falls on the pastor in the local church to help the, the, that male to become a man, a man of responsibility a man that can be trusted, a man that's loyal, a man that's not fickle, that's in and out and only wants to get his own way. And if he doesn't get, get his own way, he will bolt out the door. A, a man, if, he, if you've got a, a man alongside you, you can trust in him because with men, you know, Ed Cole used to teach us, he says, from, from women you get spirituality, but from men you get strength. Sometimes men feel a little bit out of their depth with spiritual things and even be praying and things, and all of that can be fixed and learned as well. But, but with a man, you, can get a, you get strength. And, you know, if I go into battle and there's a battle on, whatever that battle may be, if I got men alongside me, I'm very comfortable, I'm very happy because men will die for each other and they will die with each other if they have to. But boys will bolt and they're out of there. So the Bible tells us here that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. It says the old life is gone, the new life has begun. So I have news for you. Uh, my friend, if you're born again, male or female, you're a brand new creation. The old life is gone. The old life with the old whims, with the old hang-ups, with the old issues is gone. The new life has come. You're in it already. God's already made you a new creation. He placed the seeds, the posits into your life. It sits in your spirit. You see, we teach that in our new believers class that when, when we say we've become a new creation, people say, well, how? Look at me. I'm still the same. No, You see, we are a three-part being. We, we are a spirit. We have a soul and we live inside the body. And the new creation happens in your spirit the mind needs renewing we'll discuss that very shortly and the body is still the same body because people say well that can't be true because I look at myself and I'm still the same no you're brand new on the inside and furthermore in fact in the amplified translation it says the old the previously moral and spiritual condition has passed away behold the fresh and the new has come and then Romans 5 verse 5, it says that God's love has been put into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So what that's telling us is that these are just general spiritual truths that can be very much applicable in the area of, you know, husbands and wives, virtuous men, virtuous women, to become those people who God made us to be. God already made us to be virtuous people in our spirit. In your spirit, you're perfect. You're brand new. And your spirit is, is renewed day by day. It doesn't even grow old. Age in the realm of the spirit is, is no issue. Age is only in the fallen world. But in the, in the realm of the spirit, we are renewed day by day in our spirit. And God's placed seeds in there of kindness. Man, you can be a kind and a gentleman. I like the word gentleman. The gentleman is a strong man, but gentle makes him with his strength under control. He, he doesn't just blow up in all directions all the time. He's got his, his uh, temper under control. He's got a strong handle on it. Uh, that's why we call him a gentleman rather than a man that flies into a fit of rage if he doesn't get his own way and throws his toys out the cot. That's why we said parents don't let your kids have temper, tra temper tra tantrums because that will not get better. 
The mess only gets bigger. You know, a two-year-old boy, might, a three-year-old boy might break a little toy, but then, you know, he grows up, he'll break walls and doors, and he grows up beyond that, and then the mess only gets bigger. So God's love has been put out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that was given to us. So through the new birth and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit within us, we are now a new creation, a new person. God's virtue resides in our spirit. And we can be virtuous men and virtuous women. And as we prepare to close, let me quickly read Romans chapter 12, verse 2, uh, and we will, uh, and that'll be the last verse of scripture for now. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. What is the will of God where family is concerned? For virtuous men and virtuous women to be married together to produce virtuous offspring. That is the will of God. And a man can become a virtuous man. God already made him that in his spirit, but as his mind is renewed to the truth of God's word or with the truth of God's word, it's like there's a reprogramming that goes on and he becomes the very man that God has already made him to be. And the same is applicable to the woman. You know, if she was a nagging woman before, she can stop all of that and become an encouraging woman because it's already in the spirit. But through the, uh, you know, through the truth of God's work, God brings out those wonderful truths in our lives and they're fleshed out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's a process. We're born again in an instant when we commit our life to Christ and we repent of our sinful lifestyle. But the renewing of the mind is a process that begins the moment we're born again and hopefully strongly so, so that we don't take multiplied years to reach a place of maturity, but we become mature. And then, you know, the renewing of the mind goes on and on and on until we reach that place of the will of God, which is good and perfect. Uh, and what's the other word there? Good, acceptable, and perfect. We've run out of time. God bless you. Man, thank you, uh, dear ladies, for listening to me today. I trust you've been encouraged by that. Uh, let's take those words. Let's meditate in these scriptures. It brings forth transformation. Uh, our marriages, our families, everything is going to a new level as we apply these things in our lives, and our nation will be the stronger for it. Father, we thank you again for our time together here in your presence and in your word. We thank you, Lord, that these truths are impressed upon our hearts and upon our minds. We are changing. We're going from glory to glory, from strength to strength, from one degree of faith to the next degree of faith. I decree and I pronounce a blessing over every family represented here this morning. I decree and I pronounce a blessing over every marriage that is represented here this morning. We want to thank you, Father, for all good things in our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you. Have a good afternoon. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.nz. We'll see you again soon.